Oh, what? What's this? Where's the party? Great America? No. Today the party is right here. But shh, don't tell YouTube. So today, as you saw by the title, this will be part one of everything that I watched in May. And yes, part one, because somehow I watched more movies this month than I watched in April. So I believe I watched 32 movies last month, and this month I managed to watch 34. I really, I don't know how we're gonna go through it, but I've been insanely busy, like filming my short film. I've still been making content. I put out probably like eight videos this month. I don't know. I've been a little bit slower on content because of my short film, but we literally just wrapped last night. Oh, it was so bittersweet because I love working with my crew, but those were long, hard hours. We were up so freaking late every shoot night, and I think it's all gonna be worth it. We're about to start editing, and then deadlines for festivals are like late June, so anyways. Sorry, if you're new here, I do tend to go on tangents. Let's just get into the first half of the movies that I watched this past month because I have 17 movies to talk about today, and we're gonna be starting with a movie from 2014 called Time Lapse. Three friends discover a mysterious machine that takes pictures 24 hours into the future and conspire to use it for personal gain until disturbing and dangerous images begin to develop. So this movie stars my girl from Sky High. I know she's done other stuff, but that was like one of the most formative movies for me in my youth. That's how I know her and she is in this movie. I think she's great. I actually gave this movie four and a half stars, which thinking back, maybe that's not totally fair. I thought they did a crazy amazing job with such a high concept, but with such a low budget. There's also some really, really great twists in the story and I just, I love anything having to do with time, messing with time, time travel. And I thought this was a really unique concept dealing with time and I thought the way that they handled it was really good. So yeah, I don't know if it deserves four and a half stars, but I think I did that because for what they had to work with, with such a minimal budget, such minimal setting, the story was obviously really well contained because it all kind of was in one location, but the way that they did that, the movie, it, it felt bigger than it was. I don't know if that really makes sense, but like they used their space well and I really enjoyed the movie. So if the premise sounds interesting to you, then I definitely recommend checking it out. If you're not super big on indie movies, then maybe it won't be for you. I don't know, but I think that everyone will find something to appreciate about it. I think it's a well-made film. Anyways, moving on to a movie that I watched with my dad for the first time, and that would be Insomnia, which came out in 2002 and was directed by Christopher Nolan. Two Los Angeles homicide detectives are dispatched to a northern town where the sun doesn't set to investigate the methodical murder of a local teen. My dad and I actually both only gave this movie three stars. By the way, you can follow my dad on Letterboxd if you'd like to. We watch a lot of movies together, so if you want a very different perspective, a lot of his Letterboxd reviews are really funny too. But like, he's not trying to be funny. He just, he kind of writes a lot of his reviews in the way that a lot of old people text. Not that you're old, dad. I love you. You're a young man. But like I said, we both gave the movie three stars. I'm gonna move this back. This feels a little too, a little too far in the foreground for me. But for the most part, I do feel like it is a pretty well-written movie. It just feels feels like it was a little bit try-hardy. I think a lot of parts about the ending in particular just felt really cheesy. And it's not that it's not a subject matter that should be taken seriously, because it definitely was, but it just felt like they were taking it so seriously to the point of satire. And I know that that's not what Nolan was going for, so. It's also very long, and I don't necessarily feel like that was earned. I feel like if they played more into the insomnia part of this movie, because this cop is suffering from insomnia, he can't sleep. I wish that they played into that more with the style of the film, like if they kind of immersed us a little bit more in his POV, maybe I'd be fine with the length, because it's kind of like Midsommar, how they're always tripping on psychedelics, and so the movie is very long, it's in extended daylight. Oh, wait, similar themes, that both these movies take place in eternal daytime. Well, Midsommar not, to it, anyways. So I wish that kind of stylistically, and from the point of view that they shot, I wish that it was done more so to play in to that because the whole movie is called Insomnia and I just think that stylistically they could have done some cool stuff. But as is, it's just, it was a little too long for me. I don't think I'm ever gonna sit down for this one again. It wasn't super memorable to me, honestly. Even though it had such a dynamite cast like Robin Williams, Hilary Swank, Al Pacino, it just, I don't know. I don't know if this movie played into a lot of their strong suits. It just wasn't really for me, I don't know. But three stars, it's pretty well written. I think, you know, it's well directed for the most part. Just there there were a lot of ways that it could have been better, you know? Anyway, is gonna move on. The next thing I rated is actually a TV show, which is The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. As you can see, I gave this five stars. I gave it a heart. And the only thing that I wrote for my review was a 
My dad and I talked about this on the live stream that we did recently. We talked for like an hour and 45 minutes with you guys, but it was so much fun. We're definitely gonna do another one, I think this coming weekend when I go home. But anyways, we both agreed that with this show and with WandaVision, we both weren't really too big on the first two episodes of the show, but then they ended up getting way better and Falcon and the Winter Soldier, oh my God. I also tweeted about this a while back because I watched the first two episodes of Falcon and the Winter Soldier and I was like, ugh, this just feels like military propaganda. I don't really think I want to watch this. Like, this is a bit much for me. But then by the end of the show, I guess I won't give spoilers, but I feel like anyone who's a Marvel fan and anyone that cares has probably seen the end of it by now. But without giving spoilers, they flip a whole a complete 180 from the first episode. I thought we were going to be revolving around the military the way that the first couple episodes played out. I thought it was kind of like the glorification of that. And then by the end, it's no. It, no, 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 no. Nope. Very blatant blatant, potent, relevant commentary that was just so incredible. I stand my Captain America and that is all I have to say. I'm also really happy that I ended up liking this show a lot more than WandaVision. I know that whenever somebody says that they don't like something that Marvel did, there's gonna be people that are mad about it, whatever, but I didn't really like WandaVision that much. Everybody was like really obsessed with it and like I said, I mean the first two episodes were eh and then it got a lot better, specifically by like the fourth or fifth episode. Episode, there's kind of like a huge shift in narrative and that's when I started to really enjoy it. So with both shows, they kind of started off a little bit more rocky, but then by the end I was like, yeah. I mean, with Falcon and Winter Soldier, I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And with WandaVision, I was like, yeah, okay. I just wasn't that big on it. Am I alone? I really liked Falcon and the Winter Soldier, but with WandaVision, I was just like, Okay. I'm still glad that they gave her her own show because I think that that's gonna set up uh, the new Doctor Strange movie really well because I'm fairly certain that she might be the villain of that movie. So we kind of just got to see her origin story more or less. But also I don't view her as a villain because she's very dynamic and like they set up her origin story very, very well. You can easily sympathize with her. And that's my favorite, like when a villain is more dynamic and they're not just like fully evil. I prefer when things are not so black and white. So I, there are things that I do like about about WandaVision. Just as a whole, it, it it just fell a little bit flat for me. I don't know what to say. Sorry, I know that's kind of a tangent. I just wanted to talk about it because I never rated WandaVision on Letterboxd. So I just wanted to talk about it a little bit now with Falcon and the Winter Soldier. But now I'm gonna move on to the next movie that I watched, which was The Descent that came out in 2005. After a tragic accident, six friends reunite for a caving expedition. <laughs> Ugh. Their adventure soon goes horribly wrong when a collapse traps them deep underground and they find themselves pursued by bloodthirsty creatures. So The Descent, I think that it's a pretty good movie, but I only gave it three and a half stars because there's so much about the movie that works well that kind of gets tainted by the stuff that doesn't work well. But even with that being said, it's still an extremely rewatchable movie for me, particularly because I struggle with claustrophobia. So in an attempt to feel anything from a horror movie because I'm fairly desensitized, this is a great one to put on because I will feel my claustrophobia every single time. It's kind of like as above, so below, but that movie is way worse. I mean, no, I mean, so the movie is better, but my claustrophobia gets way worse with that one. Anyways, I think with that element and kind of the drama and the relationships between the women of that movie are very effective. For me personally, that would have been enough. This is also kind of a problem that I have with as above, so below because like them being trapped was enough. I didn't need them to add the creatures like, I didn't need them to add anything to it. Them being trapped in the caves and going through this drama and dealing with grief and the psychological aspects of that would have been enough for me. So I only gave it three and a half stars, but I do like the movie and it's one that I rewatch. I hadn't seen it in a couple of years and it was pretty much as good as I remembered. It's maybe not like the strongest film or maybe I should just say it's not one of my favorites because it is a strong film. It's just there are parts of it that like don't really do it for me. So I will say that it is a strong film, not one of my favorites, but it's definitely worth a watch worth a rewatch, etc. Moving on to a movie that I actually did not finish. Finish? <laughs> The next movie that I watched was The Cleaning Lady, which I actually didn't get through. So, you know, take my opinion with a grain of salt on this one. I feel bad when I do this because I feel like it's only fair to watch the entire movie to give it a chance. I just don't know many movies that I would consider to be my favorite where I hated the first half of it. So that being said, let me just read the synopsis. In a bid to distract herself from an affair, a narcissistic woman befriends a cleaning lady with burn scars, but she soon discovers that the scars may be more than skin 
in deep. So my problem with this movie is just the fact that there is like such a lack of style and it just feels like there's such a lack of stuff going on. Now I know that they must have had a pretty low budget for this one so there's not a lot that I can blame them for for like the lack of style, like the lack of it being technically well made because when you're making a feature length film with almost no budget like there's just a lot that you have to kind of skimp out on but I don't know there's just so many simple little tricks and so many ways to elevate your film without much of a budget that I don't know do I give them a pass no I don't think that I do honestly because like with time lapse that was a pretty low budget movie and they pulled it off so well they only had a couple of locations and yet it felt like a, you know a full movie it felt like a full story it didn't feel like it was really lacking in any way and this movie it just it did it's just really painfully boring and there are a couple of elements that I feel like they thought they could rely on to kind of carry the movie until it got interesting it just didn't work for me it just it just didn't so yeah I gave it one star oof sorry yeah I don't think I'm ever gonna finish it it did not interest me so that's T moving on the next thing that I watched because Mother's Day was last month was Mother's Day that came out in 2010. Crazed members of a sadistic family returned to their childhood home to terrorize the new owners. So I gave this a half star. I'm really sorry y'all because I know that some people I think recommended this movie to me. I just gave it a half star because the style of it is not for me. I'm not big on home invasion movies. They just, I don't know why because they're a very plausible thing that could happen but they just don't really do it for me. So that being said, Said, I think that this movie will definitely be for some people. It was just a little bit too brutal, a little bit too... I don't even I don't even know how to explain it. It was, it was just too much. It was too much for me. I would say don't put too much stock in my rating. Like I gave it a half star, but it's just because like I was so thrown off. It was really not the style for me at all. It was just way too gruesome and it didn't feel like that was done with much purpose other than to shock. And this was directed by Darren Lynn Bowsman and also Possessed by Horror pronounces it Boosman, which I don't know which is correct. Maybe I'll, um, let me Google that right now. It's Bowsman. I was right. Anyways, so he's directed like four of the Saw movies, I think. With Saw, it works because typically the story surrounding all the shock value is also really strong. For me, I think I got like 25 minutes into this movie and it was pure shock value. I didn't really see any type of story shining through. I didn't latch onto any of the characters. It just, it was, I don't know, it wasn't for me. Moving on now to a movie that was most definitely for me and that would be Crimson Peak directed by Guillermo del Toro. This is on Netflix by the way if you want to watch this. In the aftermath of a family tragedy an aspiring author is torn between love for her childhood friend and the temptation of a mysterious outsider. Trying to escape the ghosts of her past she is swept away to a house that breathes, bleeds, and remembers. I gave this movie only three and a half stars but I did give it a heart because despite the little bit lower rating I still loved the movie. That's mainly just because Guillermo del del Toro knows how to create a world. The style of it, it was so breathtaking. Like I just, you really get so immersed in his movies. I'm also such a sucker for Mia Wasikowska. I love her as Alice in the Alice in Wonderland movies. A lot of people kind of trash those movies and to them I say, I love them. So let's keep that to yourself. Anyways, so the mixture of her and then also, oh, Tom Hiddleston is in this movie. I'm such a sucker for so many of the people that worked on this movie. And I think that the story was so rich and so interesting. There are some unsavory plot points that I just feel like really, they, they didn't need to be there. And so for that reason, it got a few less stars from me. I'm gonna be honest, I was really off put by that. There are a lot of just like really concerning sexual elements in Del Toro's films that I don't feel like enough people talk about, namely with like bestiality and incest, but that's, we can talk about that another day. So anyways, this movie is just, it's so wonderfully transportive. It's so delicious. I had the best time just like sinking my teeth into this movie and getting transported for like two hours. So I I absolutely recommend it, especially if you love a really good stylized film. I need to move a little bit faster. We have so many movies to get through. But up next, Scott Pilgrim vs. The World came back into theaters for its 10 year anniversary. Scott Pilgrim is a 22 year old radical Canadian wannabe rock star who falls in love with an American delivery girl, Ramona Flowers, and must defeat her seven evil exes to be able to date her. So all I said in my review, I gave it three and a half stars and I said, what a breathtaking mess. Because Honestly, I know that this movie is a cult classic, but it's a mess. It's a hot, hot, hot 
mess. The writing is just, it's pretty bad, and I don't mean the dialogue because there is a lot about the dialogue that I do enjoy. I love Michael Sarah, of course, and, and so many of the other actors in this movie, but there's like, there's this one character that I think could have been fully omitted from the movie. There's this whole subplot about how Scott is dating this 17-year-old high schooler, and she's kind of just around for the entire movie, even though she's nowhere near the main love interest, and she's just there. I think that if they had just omitted her character entirely and omitted that whole subplot, I would have loved the movie. Because as is, like, yeah, I gave it three and a half stars, but that's mainly for the style and also... <laughs> I can't even, I can't even think about it without laughing, but Chris Evans' scene in this movie is brilliant. That man has so much range that we don't talk about enough. Oh, I'm out of drink. I'll be right back. Oh yeah. I kind of forget what I was saying, but basically the reason why I gave it three and a half stars still, despite the story being such a mess, is that it's one of the most stylized and most insanely edited films maybe of all time. It's so comic booky. There are so many effects. It's so weird. It's so immersive. They dedicated so much of their time to stylizing the movie, and so that's why I do have to give it props. And I also just, I adore Michael Sarah. I really like him. Up next, I watched Wreck from 2007. This is a Spanish film. A television reporter and cameraman follow emergency workers into a dark apartment building and are quickly locked inside with something terrifying. This movie is only 78 minutes long. It is so well contained. It's almost all in one or, well, no, two locations. It's only in two locations. I give it four stars. I thought that it was incredible. I'm also such a sucker for found footage. And I think that if you are also a fan of found footage, you should absolutely watch this movie, but go into it blind. That's what I did. I think I read the synopsis, but I didn't watch any trailers or anything. I also watched it because I was doing a collab with my friend Tiago and we did like a would you survive these horror movies type video. You can find that as well and find out if I would survive this movie, but I really really liked it. I wasn't a super big fan of the ending just because I felt like it was a little far out there when the rest of the movie had felt fairly grounded honestly, so I gave it four stars just because I wasn't really a fan of the ending, but the acting was phenomenal. It really did feel so real. Like this is one of those times when found footage. You know, it didn't trick me. Like, I knew it wasn't real, but the acting was so good, and I think the camera work was also really good, and they just sold it so well. I can't really think of another found footage movie where the main premise is that, like, it's a news reporter going to report something, but I think that's a wonderful premise to set up a found footage movie, and I don't know if I'd seen that before, and I think they did it so well. So anyways, I don't really have much more to say about Rec. I think you should definitely watch it. Up next, I watched Wrong Turn from 2003, which I know that this is somewhat of like a cult classic. It's an early 2000s slasher. I don't want to read the synopsis. Like a bunch of young adults get trapped in the woods where there are some inbred cannibalistic people hunting them. It very much gives me like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Cabin Fever, basically like any movie where something like that happens. I just didn't think it was really anything special. I gave it two and a half stars, which is usually what I give a movie when it's just like right in the middle of the road. Like it's not bad, but I don't think it's good. So that being said, there's nothing really wrong with it. It's just a very, very basic movie, which is not my favorite. Usually if I'm watching a slasher, I need there to be something that's like very defining about it to kind of latch on to, whether they make it like a dark comedy or they have an iconic villain, obviously. This movie, there just wasn't really any of that going on. I wasn't really feeling it. It's just nothing that I haven't seen before, and so if I wanted to watch a story like this, I would just watch one of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies, you know? So nothing really against it. It's just, I don't know, it's not really for me. Up next, we've... <laughs> Up next, these next two movies, I'm honestly not really going to talk about that much because that would be Jigsaw and Spiral from the Book of Saw. Especially not Spiral because I did a whole, like, I think 25 minute review on that movie. There's a whole spoiler free section. I also did a whole plot breakdown with spoilers and everything. So just go watch that because I've already laid out my full thoughts on that movie. But with both of these movies, I gave both of them one and a half stars. They just, they're not very good. With Jigsaw, I think I did mention this in my Saw 
raw ranking, but it took me two days to finish it because that's how much I was not feeling the movie. So much of it was just like a rehashing of things we'd already seen from the franchise before, and so many of the plot points were just so contrived, like specifically the twist ending. I wish I could understand why Jigsaw and Spiral have its fans, but I don't. I don't understand it. They're both really bad movies to me, so that being said, I don't have much more to say. I'm gonna move on to Quarantine from 2008. This is actually the remake of Wreck from 2007, but this is the American version. That being said, I don't really need to read the synopsis because also I only gave this movie two stars because it was essentially just literally a shot for shot remake of Wreck. They didn't do a single unique thing in this movie to the original and I'm like, why does it exist? Because at that point, I'm like, why would they even spend the time and money to do this when literally people could just watch like a dubbed version of the original of Wreck and that would essentially be the same thing because what like I just hate when remakes don't do anything new or anything unique or they don't add to the story or they don't change the story in a meaningful way because typically with remakes they come out a long time after the original and so they are made a little bit more modernized the topics are a little bit more relevant with this it literally came out the year after it is a shot for shot remake it's probably like one of the most lazily made films ever honestly just for that reason it's not a bad movie like I probably would have rated it higher if it hadn't just been a quite literal exact copy paste of the original I do not respect that honestly so yeah two stars that's fine I don't feel bad about that moving on now to the next movie that I watched which was Fantastic Beasts the Crimes of Grindelwald again not gonna read the synopsis because this is the sequel to Fantastic Beasts which is kind of like a spin-off of the Harry Potter universe these are of course prequels though and with Fantastic Beasts the Crimes of Grindelwald such a strange thing occurred when I watched this movie in the theater like three years ago or whatever it was I didn't like it at all. I thought that there was just like way too much going on. I hated how a lot of the characters acted. That was still kind of hard to watch this time around too because some of the characters that you know really well and love just act really whack and you're like why? What, why'd you do that? So in some places, the writing of this movie is still not immaculate, probably due to the fact that JK Rowling is a massive dunce. But if you wanna know more about that, I did do an interview with Mia Ballard and we talked about a lot of the issues surrounding JK Rowling's comments about the trans community and like ways we can help and what we can do about that. Very important conversation. I do hope that you check that out if you haven't already because we do not support JK Rowling here. Anything Harry Potter related that I own, I get from like Etsy shops and things like that. I don't get anything that's like trademarked that is connected with her. But anyway, sorry, backtracking. Even though there still was a lot about this movie that was kind of hard to watch, I actually loved it this time around. There was a lot about it that definitely could have been trimmed out. There were some subplots that just made, it was just too much going on, but I actually loved the movie this time and I don't really know what changed. I think maybe because last time I went into the movie expecting something amazing, I was so excited to see Johnny Depp as Grindelwald and he was amazing by the way. I was so excited for the movie. I think I just hyped it up way too much because I loved Fantastic Beasts. This time around I had it in my head that the movie sucked and so then it far exceeded my expectations. So yeah, there's that. There's gonna be a full review of that coming sometime this summer probably. Don't know when. My Harry Potter reviews are very, very sporadic so I'm sorry about that. That's been an ongoing series on my channel for like months now at this point. So anyways, I'm gonna move on now to the next movie that I watched, which was recommended to me, I think, by one of you guys. It's called Frailty. This came out in 2001, and it stars a lot of really big names like Bill Paxton, Matthew McConaughey, Jeremy Sumter. Oh my god, he was my Peter Pan. He was like one of my first crushes. That's, oh my god. <laughs> anyway, sorry, let me read the synopsis. A man confesses to an FBI agent his family's story of how his religious fanatic father's visions led to a series of murders to destroy supposed demons. So right off the bat, that synopsis sounds like very interesting right? And I did think that the story was super compelling and it led me to want to watch the full movie obviously, but I felt like the delivery of the story was just a little bit mediocre. I think that there were a lot of kind of stylistic choices that they made that they were trying so hard to make the movie dramatic when I think that the story they were telling honestly kind of spoke for itself and they really didn't need to do all this fancy stuff. They didn't need the really dramatic music because without that, 
that, I think the story would have been equally, if not more, impactful. Because the commentary that it's making on, like, religion and things like that, it's just, it was all, like, really, really good. I think the story was super good, but just because of, like, the delivery of it and how, kind of, like, the drama just felt a little bit cheesy to me. I gave it three stars. I do think that if nothing else, it's worth seeing for the story for sure. And also like there are some good, really big actors in it. So definitely check it out. Maybe if only for like a one-time watch. I think I actually, I watched it for free on YouTube with ads. So if you're in the US, then you can watch it for free. Okay, only two movies left to go. The next one is, oh, the Mitchells vs. The Machines. I love this movie so much. So this is the new animated movie on Netflix. It is so insane. Let me read you the synopsis. Saving the world can be a trip. A quirky, dysfunctional family's road trip is upended when they find themselves in the middle of the robot apocalypse and suddenly become humanity's unlikeliest last hope. So I gave this movie four stars and I gave it a heart because, oh my god, I totally fell for this movie. The reason why I didn't get five stars though is because the animation style, like, it's amazing. It's something so unique and different. Different. But for me, it was like really jarring at first and there were a couple of jokes that were like really, really dumb. So, and that was like kind of right in the beginning and I was kind of off put by it. I was like, do I want to finish this movie or not? And thank God that I did because I obviously really related to the main character. It's essentially a dad-daughter story and this dad who doesn't really fully understand his daughter, but she like makes all these crazy movies. She wants to go to film school, which, hello, sorry, did I hit you? My bad. And it's a story about this really weird dysfunction functional family like coming together and literally saving the world. It's amazing. It's such a weird, dumb, unique concept and I loved it. I also think that the movie made me cry like four different times. So there's that. It made me feel a lot of things, which I love. I love when a movie can make me feel stuff. So definitely, definitely check out The Mitchells vs. The Machines. It's so much fun. It's such a unique animation style too. There's a podcast that I listened to called The Big Picture and they actually interviewed the director of it. I'll try to like link the episode down below if I remember to. If you're new here, by the way, I'm really bad at remembering to link things when I say that I will in the video because I just I forget when I go to upload the video. So if I remember, I'll definitely link that episode down below because it's really interesting how he talks about like the kind of animation style that he wanted. He was like, I want to do something completely different. So how are we going to do that? And they totally pulled it off. It's such a unique movie. I think it's wonderful. Moving on now to the last movie we will talk about today, which is Unfriended from 2014. This is a found footage movie and here's the synopsis. While video chatting one night, six high school friends receive a Skype message from a classmate who killed herself exactly one year ago. At first, they think it's a prank, but when the girl starts revealing the friend's darkest secrets, they realize they are dealing with something out of this world, something that wants them dead. So I'm not like super big on this format of found footage, but I don't really mind it because I just, I like found footage in general. But I gave this movie three stars because it's not like the best. But what's really strong about this movie is definitely the story. The characters are like not super likable, which is somewhat of a problem. And also like they bicker with each other a lot and they just like all just don't really have great relationships. But this entity uses that to its advantage and the story gets so juicy. There are so many good like plot twists and turns and stuff. So the movie in its entirety is definitely worth a watch. The problem is though that like it does take a while to get there. Like it takes a while for you to feel invested in the story, which like you can see is true for a lot of movies like it takes a while to get to know the characters and stuff but with this movie the characters are not super likable and so it is kind of hard to get through I think it took me like two days to watch this because I was like do I want to finish this movie I don't know but I'm really 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 glad that I did because the story was super interesting and it got very compelling so yeah I feel like three stars is fair because the story was pretty good but you know it just it takes a while to get there and the movie as a whole is not like fantastic, you know? So I think that perhaps I would only recommend it if you are a big fan of found footage because otherwise like this is kind of an intense form of found footage where it's all just on a computer screen. That's definitely not going to be for everybody and also it, like it takes a while for the story to get good. So so like maybe I'll just recommend this for my found footage junkies. But that being said, that does it for the 17 movies that I wanted to talk about today. Catch me tomorrow or in a couple of days talking about the rest of the 17 movies that I watched this month because we have a lot more to get 
get into. I've watched a lot more really bad movies, a lot more really good movies too though. So stay tuned. If you made it to the end of the video, maybe consider subscribing. Click the notification bell so that you know whenever I post. If you would like more content from me, I do also have a Patreon that'll be linked down below. And I also have a vlog channel, which is free. So you can check out what I do over there. I usually do like get ready with me videos or just like kind of traditional vlogs. I did daily vlogging for a while. There's just like, there's something for everybody over there. And I typically tend to just like talk about whatever I feel like. So yeah, definitely consider checking that out. I also have social media if you want to follow me on, oh, on TikTok. I do a lot of ASMR. I do like DVD and Blu-ray unwrapping videos. I get some comments from people that are like very confused because they don't understand what I'm doing there. But if you're a fan of ASMR and you're a fan of physical media, it is a wonderful marriage of the two. I'm also on Twitter. I have a horror Instagram account and I love to interact with you guys over there. I have a couple more profiles linked down below. You can just go look for yourself, but I hope that you enjoyed this video and I hope to catch you in the next one. Bye! <laughs>